So um, part two of Rushes and Scales should keep us going for the next couple of weeks. Um, it basically builds on what we've seen so far. Um, it has the scales that we've looked at laid out as um, diagrams today. So they start kind of visualising where the notes are. Um, nobody's an absolute beginner, so we're not going to do always downstrokes. Um, we'll recap this whole thing about picking and then here are some sequences for people to work through one at a time. Um, we don't need to work through all of the sequences. So if we do some, if we do some swamp of words first, and I have a little sheet that I think I gave everyone for which string you'd be working on. Um, and there we go. Um, this swamp of notes tracking. It's just got date, string, number of rows and words. So we do three rounds or so, two minutes each. People can kind of start working on new strings and hopefully as the weeks pass, they'll see a little bit of an in increase and it'll just help keep people focused that this is something that you might want to do a couple of minutes of at home. So we do that first and then we'll move on to spending, say, 15, 20 minutes on this. And then um, can move on to, you know, they'll need at least, I mean, if people are getting really stuck in, we can spend a little bit longer, but um, um, we can then move on to these, some of these riffs. Um, it would be good to ask people, you know, whether to make sure they, there's something that they like the look of. If there was something they preferred from last week, that they, they liked better, then of course they can continue with, with that. Um, and then how I thought, how I saw this saging into lead guitar would be if we took some chord sequences in the key of G, potentially from the chord freedom handout. So um, G minus C, D, G, D, E minus C, E minor G, D, C, etc. And we then created some riffs where we were um, targeting the notes of the chords. And I'll write a little primer for that in just a sec. But essentially what that's going to be is, let's say our chord progression was G, D, E minor, C. We would want to start on a note from the chord. And then when we got to D, we would want to get to a note from D. And when we, you know, you know the drill. I'm not, <laughs> obviously don't need to explain this to you. Um, so, um, we could break that down into pairs of chords to begin with and have students choose what note they're going to start on and what note they're going to land on. And they don't have to be adjacent, but they could be. And you can sort of set something like, you're allowed a maximum. I think the other day I did this and I had people start on E minor chord and use the E minor string to bounce from. So E minor to D was something. Like You know, etc. And then it's going to have something that sounds quite cool. Um, so um, in the lead class, you're going to have Jackie um, and Hayden and Paul Wilson. So Hayden and Paul can approach this from our arpeggio point of view, um, and um, Jackie can approach this um, from the point of view of these this stuff from here, just extending it. Um, and so it's going to be about creating new, creating riffs, basically. Um, I'll write out a few restrictions to give the arpeggio players. Uh, what I find has been working really well is to get them to do things like, for any given chord sequence, play the chord sequence in one type, one inversion of arpeggio only and then the next inversion of arpeggio only, and then the third inversion of arpeggio only, and then do them in position. You combine them, but it seems to work a lot better going doing it in that order. And doing it all like in free time to begin with, and then doing it in a, in a set rhythm so that they might not have a chance to play all of the notes in arpeggio. And then um, going up one arpeggio, down the next one, up the third one, down the next one, then um, landing on the root every time so that they really are reinforcing where the root note is then starting to create 
diff- um, create motives that are based around the arpeggio shape but aren't just playing the arpeggio up and down. And for that, um, changing how many notes each bar has has worked really well so that they don't go do 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 do. And I'm gonna, I'll write a little list of restrictions that they can work through. And this is really to help them get the most out of each arpeggio shape and start to add some phrasing um, and sliding and then to potentially add add notes in on certain bits of the chord. So for example, if we're thinking about G, D, E minor, C, um, um, then um, when it comes to the C chord, um, no, the D chord, it can be like, oh, well, we're gonna add the, we're gonna add the flat seven in. So add starting to, for those who've seen arpeggios, like certainly for Hayden, he can start to add other notes in um, to create his, his riffs and arpeggios. And I think there'll be enough in that to, to easily kind of go for an hour once you've done all the different ways of playing it up and down. And, um, you know, now on this chord, you're going to land on the root. On this chord, you can land on, you know, change the, we can change the note that we're landing on in each chord. Um, I think that'll be loads, but one could always then apply it to a different key. So, for example, now we're going to move it. So we wouldn't be able to do that with G major. No, just same key, but you can just, you know, do it, um, change the chord progression. Um, and and repeat it. Um, so I think that will be loads. If you are not sure whether that's going to be a lot enough, then um, do let me know. Um, and in the meantime, I'll create those extra little bits that I mentioned. <laughs>